next time you have an opportunity to make a difference for animals, will you be brave enough, yes or no? Hi guys, this is James again, and today we're going to be looking at Blog 5, Activity 16, which is about ecological dimensions and how people actually go about the act of poaching. Within Africa, there's a huge variety of different ecologically important areas. Um, for our purposes, we're going to divide them up into the main sort of regions, which are your savanna, your deserts, and of course your rainforests, which occur more in Central Africa. So what we're going to talk to you guys about today is how the people from these rural areas that are encroaching onto our, our, our protected regions actually go about the act of poaching. Now, how each individual can negatively affect the environment through their actions. Unfortunately, what's happened is we've got to a stage now where there are more people closer to your protected areas that have so little money or so little resources that they are almost forced into going into these areas and stealing the resources from them in order to survive. Now, this can be anything from uh, a simple person coming in and chopping down trees to create a fire to feed their family, or it can be even worse than that, where a middleman or someone from another country from far away comes in and says, I will give you so much money to come in and poach one of our rhinos. So this is what we're going to look at, is how these people really go about doing these acts. Snaring is one of the biggest problems we have when it comes to poaching, um, especially for some of your smaller game, because what used to happen is your original hunter-gatherers would come in and they would use uh, twine or rope to, to, to catch animals, but now it's getting even worse where the guys will enter properties, even cut the wire from their fences and, and use that to poach the animals. Now snares are like landmines. As soon as they're set, they'll hardly ever, ever go, uh, go bad. It's not like they rust away and just disappear into the environment. They will be there for a very long time. So they're sitting there just waiting for an animal to come through and be caught. Snares are really indiscriminate things. They can catch anything from, from your, some of your small antelope to anything as large as an elephant. It just depends on the type of snares that the guys use as to what they can, what they can catch and what they can contain within that. A lot of the wounds from snares can go septic and that can lead to animals dying later on down the road even if they have managed to escape from the snares. This was snail killed a buffalo two years ago. I think this is the third year now. When I was patrolling with Zanzani and Timothy, we found that a bull buffalo was killed by this snail. It was just lying here. So it tried to make an ambush for about two days. So the poachers did not come but the buffalo when rotten. So most of the time the animals are coming in this area for salt lake. This is a salt lake area. So there's nat there's natural salt in the ground here. Yes. Mm -hmm. So most of the time the animals are keep coming here and the poachers they look such places to put their snails. Of course, nowadays, one of, the, one, of the, one of the biggest threats that we have is firearms. And guys come in using weapons such as bolt-action rifles or AK-47s, and they'll come in and they'll start hunting the animals that we're trying to protect. This illegal hunting is causing so many problems, it's allowing people to decimate vast herds of, of, of wildlife in short periods of time. We have gotten to the stage where people are using high-powered rifles and are able to take an animal from quite a distance, so there's no longer a threat to their life while they're trying to hunt these animals. Many years ago, uh, when it was a lot simpler, your hunters or poachers would come in with simple rifles and they would go out looking for the animals and they would hunt them like, like many hunters do nowadays. Unfortunately, with the advancement in technologies, these guys are now using much, much stronger and much more high calibered rifles. Um, they're using silencers, night vision equipment, these kind of things are making it much more difficult for our rangers to come up against poachers in a contact situation. It's much more dangerous for them and it's much more easier for the poachers to take down the quarry that they're after. Even before then, poaching was rife in, in, in a lot of rural areas when huge amounts of animals were taken out simply by the use of spears, axes, pangas. Nowadays, pangas such as this one here would only be carried by the, by the group to hack off the horn of the rhino or remove the, the ivory from the elephant if it came down to that. Um, before then, those would have been your staple weapons used by your original hunters. Uh, back then even, and even still today, in some areas where, where the populations aren't able to purchase 
high powered rifles and, and, and more expensive weaponry and things, they will still use dogs and spears to chase down animals. This is just as much of a problem as it's, as it's limiting the amount of populations that can survive around these rural areas. So you're getting these huge pockets of land with no animals left whatsoever. This to us is, is a major detriment to the ecosystem as it's removing these animals from their natural habitat and leaving nothing left for future generations. Along with some of these more traditional methods of, uh, of using axes and, and, and machetes and, and dogs, poachers often still like to use fire as an asset for them to, to conduct these illegal activities. By burning an area, it forces the, the game and the wildlife into a certain area, which will allow them to, to hunt them down or to, to move those animals away from a region that might be more difficult for them to hunt in. Before, this, this used to be a way of herding the game into a specific hunting grounds, but poachers have now gone back to a lot of these old tactics because they're still sort of tried, tested and true, and they're able to, to use these to their advantages. As we've talked about more modern day technologies entering the world of poaching, we need to look at some of the other methods that people are using. And, and this goes beyond simple firearms or the use, of, the use of snaring. And that's where things such as veterinary medicine comes in. Now we've seen a huge rise in the use of veterinary drugs such as M99 or etorphin, which is used to sedate or knock down an animal. It's, a, it's an opioid based drug and it can have a huge benefit to wildlife and wildlife conservation when used in the right hands of the right vets. Unfortunately, if it falls into the wrong hands, these people and the poachers that are employed to do this can then use these drugs to knock an animal so completely out and it's so very quiet and silent, they're able to move in, dart the animal, knock it down, remove the horn and get out of there without even the sound of a gunshot. This makes it a lot harder for our rangers to track down uh, the poachers that have been involved. We've seen a large increase in, in the use of poisons as well. Poisons such as cyanide and temming is becoming more and more popular where poachers will move into a region with a watering hole and they'll actually poison the water system. By poisoning this water system, they're allowing any animal that comes into that region to be affected. So they might be able to simply remove the, the meat or the furs or whatever, as long as the poison hasn't negatively affected the meat, of course. But as well as where there's regions where there's elephant, they can poison a whole herd of elephants at once, uh, allowing them to take a huge, huge sum of ivory away from that scene and get out of there before the authorities are even aware of anything's happened. This is getting uh, to be even a bigger problem in some areas because vultures, of course, when they come down, re receive secondary poisoning from the carcasses, killing out 400 vultures at a time. Vultures are a huge, huge importance to our ecosystem. So losing that number of vultures in one go is going to have huge negative effects on our environments. Now, of course, uh, a lot of people are less reliant on, on having to walk for vast distances to, to poach some of these animals. And of course, in some areas that's still necessary, but with the advance in technologies and the availability of more vehicles these days, uh, we're finding a, a higher increase in people using things such as cars and trucks to get into reserves, as well as helicopters and micro lights to get into an area. If someone comes in and is able to pinpoint a, a rhino, for example, with a helicopter and then shoot it or dart it from that helicopter, it's going to be much more difficult for us to trace it back to the people that are involved. It takes away a lot bigger risk for the, the poachers on the ground and is definitely harder for us to follow up. So as you can see, there's a huge range of, uh, of different techniques that poachers can use in different systems. And in order to combat these poachers, we need to be able to learn and adapt to each of these systems that they use. What's really at stake here is the fact that everything that we do negatively to an ecosystem or to an environment is going to have a huge impact. And it can be anything from people removing the rhino from, from the Kruger National Park to us continuing collecting shells or stones from, from a nature reserve, from a beach. We have to be very sensitive to what we do because everything within these environments are interlinked and, and are a part of the whole food chain and, and, and web of life that goes on through these systems. We need to be very aware of everything and therefore we need to really think about what we do before we harvest any sort of resource from any protected area. 
Okay, so thank you very much guys. Um, I hope you learned something from this today and your teacher is now going to take you through uh, activity 16. So enjoy!